CSIS lecture series on regional dynamics. And uh, today, we are very lucky to have an honorable speaker, Senator Penny Wong. She's the leader of the opposition in the Senate and also she had a Minister for Foreign Affairs and Labour Senator for South Australia. She has a very long CV, but I think it's worth reading because that might give us some background of probably what she's going to speak about. She was born in Malaysia. As an eight-year-old, she moved to Australia with her family and settled in Adelaide. <coughs> she has a degree in law and arts from the University of Adelaide. I'm also the proud alum, alumni of the University of Adelaide. She went on to practice labor law, advocating for the rights of workers. She secured better pay and condition for workers as a union representative <coughs> and served as a policy advisor in the New South Wales government. She then was elected to the Australian Senate in 2001, with her first term commencing in 2002. She was re-elected in 2007, 2013, and in the double dissolution election of 2016. After just two years in the Senate, Senator Penny Wong was promoted to the Shadow Ministry. Upon the election of the Labour government in 2007, she was appointed Minister for Climate Change and Water. In Labour's second term, she served as Minister for Finance and the Regulation. In 2013, Senator Wong was appointed leader of the government in the Senate, the first woman to hold this role in Australia. After the change of government, she became leader of the opposition in the Senate. And since 2016, Senator Wong has served as Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, and now she lives in Adelaide with her partners and two daughters. Today, she will be speaking about protecting and promoting regional interests in a time of US-China strategic competition. And uh, I believe this will also be useful for the Indonesian aud audience <coughs> as we are also debating in Indonesia and in the region, in Southeast Asia, how we are going to protect our regional interests in the time of strategic competition between the US and China. Senator Wong, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Philip. I appreciate the Centre for Independent Studies hosting me today. And I appreciate meeting an, uh, an alumnus from my University of Adelaide. Can I acknowledge also um, excellent, His Excellency Dino Jalal, a good friend of Australia's. And uh, honoured ladies and gentlemen, ba 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 ba, ibu ibu yang terhormat. I'm delighted to be back here in this exciting city. I was here only last month, in fact, accompanying the leader of the Australian Labor Party, Anthony Albanese, on his first international visit as Labor leader. And of course, Indonesia was a very deliberate choice for us and for the leader on his first visit, signifying the importance of the bilateral relationship to Australia and to Australian Labor. I want to start first with the nature of the region. Dunia tidak semata sedang berubah, tetapi sedang terdisrupsi. Dan di era disrupsi ini, kemapanan bisa runtuh, ketidak mungkinan bisa terjadi. I apologize if my pronunciation is not great, but I'm quoting your president. The world is not only changing, it is experiencing disruption. In this era of disruption, the establishment may collapse, the impossibility may prevail. And so spoke President Widodo in his state address on the 74th anniversary of independence just last one month. And the President's words are a stark warning of the risks and challenges we face in this time of disruption. 
Countries are grappling with inequality, ethnic tensions, greater numbers of displaced persons, security threats ranging from terrorism to cyber attacks, rising nationalism and pressures on democracy. In the international system, we see erosion in support for international norms, rules and institutions, and power is shifting. The balance of economic and strategic power is changing. The two great powers, the US and China, are both, in different ways, choosing paths which challenge the status quo. Their strategic competition is increasingly defining intent and driving behaviour. It is the narrative of these times. And whilst competition is inevitably an aspect of international relations, unless it is balanced by the objective of cooperation, our peace and our stability become vulnerable. Competition that is not conditioned by the recognition of shared interests, that assumes a zero-sum outcome is a risky path for all. Our region is a focal point of disruption. Increasingly, it is also a locus of competition. Now, this is not a new experience for the nations of Southeast Asia. Great power competition has shaped and disrupted this region throughout its history, including in recent generations during World War I and the Cold War. And with the insights this history brings, you understand the imperative of working to avert unrestrained competition. In the midst of this disruption, countries of our region must do more than navigate the slipstream. We must do what we can to shape the outcome we want. And we must start with a focus on the sort of region we want, one where none of us is subject to the hegemony of another. Australia wants a region which retains a system of institutions, rules and norms to guide behaviour, to enable collective action and to resolve disputes. A region in which those seeking to make or shape rules do so through negotiation and not imposition. A region with an open trading system and investment transparency to maximise opportunity. And a region where outcomes are not determined only by power. A region where all people live in peace and prosperity. We know poverty alleviation is a necessary, although not sufficient foundation of stability and prosperity. And democratic governance and human rights are critical to sustainable development and lasting peace. A region with these characteristics reflect Australia's national interests and our values. Indonesia has articulated similar objectives. As your President has said, Indonesia wants a region based on principles of openness, transparency and inclusion, built through a habit of dialogue and respect for international law. So what does maintaining a region with these characteristics require? In a context of increasingly intense strategic competition, how do we realise our shared objectives? We can only realise our objectives through a multipolar region. A multipolar region in which the United States remains deeply and constructively engaged, in which China is a positive contributor, and in which the perspectives and contributions of smaller powers are respected and valued. A region in which there is shared support for international rules, norms and characteristics. Now, the United States has played a foundational role in modern Asia in the post-World War II era. US presence has formed, trans transformed Australia's security and the security of its other allies and partners. It was a key driver of international trade and investment regimes that enabled our economies to prosper. And beyond military and economic power, the United States also matters in the region because of its values and what it represents. Our future resilience, prosperity and security depend on ongoing and strengthened constructive engagement from the United States. But also key to the future of our region is the extent to which China is a positive contributor. China is critical to the shape and character of the entire region. In fact, it is hard to think of an important issue for the region's future where China will not be an influential player. Welcome. China is and will continue to be of great importance to Australia, to our region and the world. We recognise that China has a right to develop and a right to a role in the region alongside other regional powers. We do not and should not preemptively frame China only as a threat. 
But we also recognise that China is not a democracy, nor does it share our commitment to the rule of law, and differences between our systems and values will inevitably affect the nature of our interactions. And they will and do affect the nature of China's behaviour and ambitions in the region. There is no doubt that under President Xi, China has evinced increasing assertiveness in pressing its interests. It has also demonstrated its belief as to its right to a greater role in the region. None of this is particularly surprising. As China's relative economic weight increased, it is unsurprising that it would seek a greater say in our region. The question is, on what terms? Australia is not alone in expressing concerns about some of Beijing's actions, including, for example, land reclamation, militarisation, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing in the South China Sea, cyber attacks and issues around intellectual property theft and industrial subsidies. And it is legitimate that these concerns are aired and addressed. Such behaviour is not consistent with the region we want. The shape and character of the region we want depends not only on the way the two great powers engage with the region, but also how they engage with each other. The relationship between the United States and China is the most significant in the world today. Its character will determine our region for decades to come. And it is clear that the United States and China now treat each other as strategic competitors. The strategic competition in our region means we need to think carefully and engage actively to avoid becoming collateral. Great powers do and will do what great powers do. They assert their interests. But the rest of us are not without our own agency. As Bilahari Kausikan somewhat provocatively asserts, under present circumstances, there may be no sweet spot we can occupy that will keep both the Chinese and the Americans simultaneously happy. There is no silver bullet, and it is a fool's errand to look for one. Neither can we just lie low and hope for the best. You may not look for trouble, but trouble may come looking for you, and trouble is all the more likely to seek you out if either side thinks you are or can be intimidated. We must have the courage to pursue our own national interests. I want to turn now to the regional realities because the strategic competition of which we speak is taking place within the context of certain regional realities and these inevitably frame our interests and shape our decisions. And this is something we must remind both great powers of. We need to address the competition paradigm directly by being clear about the reality of its boundaries. So I'd like to highlight what I would refer to as the four realities. First, the reality of economic trends. I often reference a compelling chart in the Australian Government's Foreign Policy White Paper, Figure 2.4, and it projects GDP in purchasing power parity terms out to 2030. US GDP rises from 18.6 trillion US dollars in 2016 to 24 trillion in 2030. China's GDP rises from 21.4 trillion US dollars to 42.4 over the same period. So within a decade, the Chinese economy is set to become nearly twice as large as the economies of the US, India and the EU, and seven times larger than the economy of Japan. Alternatively, if you look at GDP in MER, market exchange rate terms, PWC's World Report, World in 2050 report, predicts US GDP will rise from 18.6 trillion in 2016 to 26.5 trillion in 2030, China's GDP rises from 11.4 trillion US dollars to 26.5 trillion over the same period, the same size on MER terms. And even if these figures don't quite reach the heights projected, the trajectory outline represents a fundamental reshaping of the global economy and the regional economy with profound implications for our region and profound implications for the United States. Secondly, there is the reality of our economic engagement with China. China is a top trading partner for many countries in our region, a major source of investment and an intrinsic part of global and regional supply chains. Indeed, the Lowy Institute Asia Power Index has ranked China first in economic resources, largely due to economic weight, that is the size of its economy, and its connectivity the capital flows and physical means by which countries connect to and shape the global economy. Moreover, the size and nature of most regional economies means we will continue to rely upon open trade and foreign investment. 
even if one assesses that the US and China can actually decouple from each other, the integration of both major powers in the global economy means that the rest of us will not be able to do so. So, economic engagement with China remains imperative. It is in Beijing's interest too, regardless of what other choices and decisions we might make. Third, there is the reality of China's place in the world. To a much greater extent than the Soviet Union in the Cold War, China is deeply enmeshed in the international system. Beijing is actively engaged in all the major international organisations, from the UN Security Council to the IMF, World Health Organisation and Interpol. And its role is integral to the resolution of global issues and challenges from climate change to nuclear disarmament. And the fourth reality is the reality of power. Over the next decades, neither the United States nor China will be able to exert undisputed primacy. They must be prepared to live with each other as a major power. These are the realities that underlie the decisions of regional countries and must inform the interactions of both Beijing and Washington. The United States is Australia's closest friend and our most important security partner. Our alliance is long-standing and enduring and this closeness enables us to have frank conversations. It is, in, it is within this context that we speak of the risks associated with a narrow focus on strategic competition and how that is expressed in our region. Of course, competition in and of itself is not a bad thing, but a strategic competition frame that manifests as you're either with us or against us limits the scope of regional players to make decisions that contribute to the region we want. It disregards the four realities, and it reinforces, even if not intentionally, the notion of a binary choice, that the only alternatives are accepting a Chinese-led regional order or unconditional support for US-defined strategic competition with Beijing. This ultimately is not in the United States' interests. The current trade war is the most prominent example, although this dynamic is not limited to the economic sphere. It is a binary frame in which the gains are unclear, but the losses could be catastrophic. And while some countries may benefit in the immediate term as some companies shift locations, the uncertainty felt in global markets and the trend towards greater protectionism will lead to negative economic consequences for many of us, including Australia, because fundamentally no one wins from a trade war. So I look forward to seeing what benefits our Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, secured from his state visit to Washington over the weekend, and particularly whether he has been able to shape the administration's thinking and language on a trade war. The trade war also undermines multilateralism and the rules-based trading system, including by reinforcing the idea that size and economic power determine the terms of engagement. And it perpetuates the perception that for Washington, regional engagement is secondary to the US-China relationship and that we all only matter in relation to its competition with China. US leadership is most effective when it is conceived in terms of leading a community of nations with all that entails. Of course, this is not just an issue for the United States. Beijing too should recognise that most of us in the region are not comfortable with an authoritarian China becoming the predominant power. It's fair to say that many countries in the region are unclear about what precisely it is that the United States is seeking to achieve. More questions like those raised by Kurt Campbell and Jake Sullivan need to be asked. What exactly is the US competing for? And what might a plausible desired outcome of this competition look like? Absent that clarity, China will assume the worst. It will give fuel to those within the Communist Party of China who believe that the US wants to thwart China's rise and contain it. Of course, given the entrenched narrative within China about US ambitions of containment, it is possible that greater US clarity won't quell China's Chinese suspicions. But more clarity would give greater assurance to other regional countries who must deal with the geographic and economic realities of China as it is, and some of the disruptive actions and rhetoric from the United States under President Trump. So what is a realistic and workable vision of an end state or settling point? These are all fundamental questions, the answers to which will influence how we all respond. 
A greater, focus, a greater focus on the likely settling point will enable the US to recognise and embrace the fact that multipolarity in the region is likely to get stronger. And in the context of Beijing's ambitions, this growing multipolarity with countries like Indonesia, India and Japan playing increasingly important leadership roles in the region is beneficial to Washington's interests. Defining a realistic settling point will also help the United States recognise and accept that decisions relating to China will vary depending on the issues and interests at stake. And it would help remind Beijing that when we make decisions that defend or assert our national interests in ways that may not reflect China's views, it is not due to a Cold War mentality. Framing this settling point in terms of what we share would help foster cooperation within ASEAN nations. Our relationships to and with the US will inevitably be different by virtue of our own histories and interests. Some of us have formal alliance partnerships with the United States. Others are steeped in the non-aligned movement. Some of us have economies that are complementary with China's. Others are more directly competing. A focus on the nature of the region and the individual and collective benefit to many regional players enables greater possibilities for working cooperatively than a simple focus on strategic competition. We should expect China to respect the core elements that define a stable, peaceful and prosperous region. And we also look to the United States to present a positive narrative and vision about the future by articulating and presenting what it offers, not only what it is against. As our former Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Peter Varghese, puts it, those of us who value US leadership want the US to retain it by lifting its game, not spoiling China's. The decisions made by the Trump administration, including the withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the UN Human Rights Council, the Iran nuclear deal, and the imposition of quotas and tariffs, including on allies and partners, indicates a rejection, at least in part, of the rules and norms to which we have become accustomed. I spoke earlier about Beijing's increasing assertiveness in seeking to shape the region in line with its preferences and ambitions and some of its actions and behaviours not being conducive to the kind of region in which we want to live. It is evident that both great powers are challenging the status quo, though in differing ways and to differing degrees. So we are, in fact, faced with a choice. But it is not the US-China binary. The choice is this. Are we simply to be spectators to the consequences of the strategic competition in our region, or do we work proactively and collectively to shape rules, norms and standards in line with our interests and our values? Some have already relegated ASEAN to the sidelines. They point to the consensus-based practice of decision-making and increasingly divergent strategic perspectives across the 10 member states as constricting ASEAN's ability to respond effectively. The ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, championed by Indonesia, reflects a desire for this not to be the case. I quote briefly from it. It is in the interest of ASEAN to lead the shaping of their economic and security architecture and, to en and ensure that such dynamics will continue to bring about peace, security, stability and prosperity for the peoples in Southeast Asia, as well as in the wider Asia-Pacific and Indian Ocean regions or the Indo-Pacific. ASEAN also needs to continue being an honest broker within the strategic environment of competing interests. Well, these objectives, as outlined in the Outlook, are welcome. Of course, in practice, beyond asserting ASEAN's role, it also requires ASEAN to insert itself in the process of regional balancing and regional adjustment. And this matters. It matters for ASEAN centrality. It matters for the region because the region we want needs the engagement and support and ultimately the ownership of the major Southeast Asian nations. So the question is, what can we do together and what can we do on our own to ensure the region we want? As we work collectively, we should focus on upholding the existing rules and norms we want to protect, like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And we should focus on being standard setters for new norms, rules and institutions, or for those that need it, need to be made fit for purpose. It is apparent, for example, that some aspects of the WTO's structures, rules and standards no longer reflect the world's economic realities. 
Yet for countries like Australia and Indonesia, it remains a vital, vital multilateral organisation for managing trade issues. So I welcome Indonesia's indication at the G20 of a desire to drive initiatives for WTO reform. Australia's history of proactive leadership in multilateral trade, including through the Cairns Group and Apex focus on regional economic integration, is a tradition we must continue. Australia and Indonesia can draw on our shared interests and experiences to work to ensure the WTO remains fit for purpose and that the creation of new standards on issues it does not effectively cover, like e-commerce and state-owned enterprises, reflect our values and our interests. This is important too in the negotiation of norms and practices to manage the development of cyber security, smart cities, smart cities, AI, and the regulation of social media. In doing so, we should recall what Foreign Minister Retno Masudi said in her annual foreign policy statement at the beginning of this year. ASEAN must be proactive in addressing strategic developments and changes in the region. ASEAN must always be the driver for progress in the region. Of course, our domestic policies and actions not only have consequences for our own well-being, they also matter for the nature of our region. We must work to ensure our economic and social policies provide benefits for all. And whilst Australia has so far avoided the political polarisation manifest in many nations around the world, we are not immune from the risk. Australia's economy continues to grow, but we are experiencing the slowest economic growth since the global financial crisis and wage growth for workers has stagnated. This demonstrates that our prosperity is not being shared equally. Greater inequality at home risks undermining the very characteristics of the region we are seeking to ensure. Similarly, Indonesia's domestic focus on economic development is good for Indonesia, and a strong and prosperous Indonesia is good for our region. As a multicultural country that draws strength from our waves of migration and from our first peoples, Australia must ensure we remain an inclusive society. And as a country with the world's largest Muslim population, diverse in culture, religion and geography, Indonesia also finds strength in diversity and inclusivity. In this disrupted world, we all need to find ways to ensure the resilience of our own democratic institutions. So in conclusion, I'd say this. What our region is looking for is less a context, contest about who will be or who is number one than how we foster partnerships of enduring connection and relevance. Partnerships that respect sovereignty, support development objectives, and contribute to a peaceful, stable, secure, prosperous, and inclusive region. Then there is the region, the question of how we strengthen regional architecture and maximise our opportunities for engagement. Indonesia is already taking a leading role in strengthening Indo-Pacific regional architecture, including by recognising that other countries' notions of the Indo-Pacific and existing bilateral and minilateral arrangements can coexist with ASEAN-led mechanisms. You have also initiated coordination and cooperation mechanisms within ASEAN and strengthened the role of other groupings such as IORA, the Southwest Pacific Dialogue and Trilateral Maritime Cooperation with the Philippines and Malaysia. Indonesian willingness to contribute, Indonesian willingness to lead is welcome. And what we do at home also matters for the kind of region we want. We know we know that the region needs more cooperation. Sorry, what our region is looking for, as I said, is less a context, a contest about who should be or will be number one than how we foster partnerships of enduring connection and relevance. We know that the region needs more cooperation, not less, though not cooperation at any cost. The onus is on all of us to protect and advance our interests. As President Wododo said last month in his state address on the 74th anniversary of independence, Dalam situasi dunia yang penuh persaingan, misi untuk ikut membangun tatanan dunia yang lebih baik tidak boleh kita abaikan. In a global situation full of competition, the mission to participate in building a better world order must not be ignored. Terima kasih atas kehadiran anda sekalian hari ini. Thank you very much for your attention.